The NES Classic took the world by storm last year. Combining a decent price with the right combination of nostalgia, it sold off the shelves and then disappeared altogether, leaving many people upset that they didn't get one. In my last video, I showed how China is dealing with the situation by introducing a bootleg of the NES Classic. Now, there's actually different versions of that bootleg out there, but it's interesting because the NES Classic isn't even an original idea. Now, even if we ignore the flashback consoles that Atari puts out every year, as well as one for the ColecoVision and the Intellivision, the NES has seen this treatment before. The NES was actually bootlegged before the NES Classic existed. So I have an example of that. This here is the Power Arcade. This packs in more games than the NES Classic at more than 100. It features two-player playback with a controller port mounted on the top. And if you're wondering what this little nozzle is, it also has a built-in zapper with the triggers here and here. Now that's not the best way to play zapper games, but it does seem to fit a lot into a 10 to 15 year old package. Might be even a little bit older than that. The system runs on AA batteries, or you can plug it in. It has AV out, and it has a working analog stick. Now it's not actually analog, it works the same as the D-pad, but there were many of these units released in N64 controllers where this essentially did nothing. So let's plug it in, give it a quick test. I'm also curious as to whether or not this is pretty much exactly the same hardware as the other bootleg we looked at. I'm going to try the second player controller in this port and we'll see if it works. Then we'll tear it down and see what makes it tick. So as you can see it's 118 and 1, which leads me to believe we're going to see a similar circumstance to the other bootleg that we looked at. You'll notice that all these games are ones that do not require extra chips, so like the MMC3. You won't find Mario 3 on a system like this because they would have had to add additional hardware to make it work. One of the problems I was discussing with the, or with the other bootleg is that the audio quality was terrible in Super Mario, and we'll hear what that sounds like here. So as you can see, the sound sounds muted, the jump just doesn't sound right. None of the sound effects sound quite right. Well, let's kill Mario off and see if we can control Luigi with the controller from the other bootleg. And it looks like everything works. And by everything I mean left, right, and jump. And run. Run works too. Now it's interesting, it says Luigi, but I think when Mario's up it only says player. Oh, sorry, it says score instead of Mario. Well, let's reset and take a look at some of the other stuff. Now I'm going to give you a look at how the zapper works. Go ahead and unplug the second player controller for this. It's unwielding enough as it is without it. So I guess the idea is you should get sort of right behind it. There we go. Well, it's not terrible. It certainly does the job, although I've never seen a gun that you have to aim like this before. Let's see what else we have on here. Well, we have Super Contra. Now, it has A, B, X, and Y. A is typical A, B is typical B. X and Y are turbo versions of those buttons. And as you can see, the analog stick doesn't work as an analog stick, but it does the job. Again, the sound isn't perfect, but it is better than it was in Mario. It's interesting that one of the first games released is one of the one hardest ones that they have emulating. So, we can give Donkey Dong a shot. Now that sounds the way it should. And so does the music. Yep, sound effects are good. It controls pretty well considering how 
cheaply how cheap the plastic feels on this controller. Clearly I'm no Steve Weeby or Billy Mitchell. Alrighty, we'll take a look at one or two one or two more and then we will get into dissecting this. See if there's any inter anything interesting in here. Now, this is pretty much the standard selection that you used to get on the 110 and, well, obviously 118 in one cartridges that uh, they had for the original NES. They did the typical trick where they split Duck Hunt and Clay Shoot up to turn them into two separate games. Well, there's let's uh, there's one here called Fighting Contra. I'm pretty sure this is just gonna be a slightly modified version of Contra. Oh, see, so you have 30 lives by default. Oh, and you start in the uh, jungle level with this the fireball weapon. That's weird. It's still. I didn't think it gave you uh, both players um, power-ups if you were only playing single-player. Now let's fire up Pac-Man, then we'll call it a day. Actually, you know what? For uh, oh, I, I was about to say the analog stick is better for Pac-Man than the D-pad was, but it doesn't control very well. Okay, well... Now that we've seen how it plays, let's see what's inside it. ...taken apart. Years and years separated. Well, I'm going to try and not damage the wires, but... Hmm. So it looks like, and I can't tell, I would say it's soldered all the way through, so we're going to have to remove this board as well to get a look at it, but I don't think we're going to be able to see the underneath of it. But there's our glop top uh, attached to a board where it's soldered in, So, and that board is not much bigger than the board was in the NES Classic bootleg, as you can see. So once again, this is the guts of the entire operation. It splits out from here and goes to the board which has the controllers and the AV and everything on it, but all the magic happens here. Once again, we have a Nintendo on a chip, I'm assuming, on the back. We can't see it um, because it is soldered directly to the board underneath. But then we have our glop top, so this is the essence of a 118 in one cartridge, and that's it. It works exactly the same as the current NES Classic knockoff from AliExpress. So they, they really did find a way to re repackage some old technology that they probably just had lying around and get some more money out of it. And I think that was evident by the fact that the two-player controller is wired exactly the same as it is on the uh, the new system. When the Power Arcade was new, they were selling for about $20 a piece at kiosks and malls in Canada, which is about equivalent when adjusted for inflation to the cost of the new NES Classic bootleg. It's interesting to note that the Nintendo on a chip that's contained within these controllers would actually go on to some legitimate uses. They were used in several versions of the Atari flashback console with Atari games being rewritten or emulated on that architecture. And also, the Intellivision TV Play Power System. Now I've had this one since it was new, it still works, but this will be the subject for another video. So once again, I'm James from Print and Play. If you like this video, why not toss me a thumbs up? If you want to continue to receive content like this, why not subscribe so you're notified as soon as I put it out? And if you have another system you want me to look at in the future, toss it in the comments below and I'll see what I can do. Until next time, stay creative.